My name is um, Brooke Laundry, and I am Dr. Quatella's patient consultant. Um, I've been with Dr. Quatella. Um, I started with him in 2000 as his patient consultant. Um, my role in the practice is that I can, um, we do what's called an image enhancement session, which is the first step in understanding potential options that people have for elective procedures that Dr. Quatella um, does do. I'm just going to admit a couple more people here, so bear with me. All right. I think, I think everybody's coming in. So, um, so one of the nice features that we have here um, as part of the information gathering session is that we do what's called um, an image enhancement session. And is, that is the first step where patients come in and meet with me and we talk about what is bothering them. And I'm able with many different procedures to um, actually show you what those cosmetic changes can be on the computer. At that point too, we also go into the particular procedures that you're interested in and then talk about um, all of the particulars as far as that procedure goes. Um, so I'm just gonna let a couple more people in here. All right. Um, so one of the nice things that you guys um, will listen to uh, as far as Dr. Patella goes is he's tonight is going to talk about some rhinoplasty and facial contouring procedures. Um, most of it is considered surgical, but there is a couple non-surgical options that we can um, do an overview on. Um, so Dr. Patella is a double board certified facial plastic surgeon. And um, Dr. Gratella, if you wanna just um, advance to the next slide here. Okay. So as you can see, um, Dr. Gratella, there he is. He's a double board certified facial plastic surgeon. Um, he has over 34 years of experience, uh, particular with uh, surgery of the face. Um, he currently is the president of the International Federation of Facial Plastic surgeon. So um, that is one of the, the highest uh, honors that he can have. He currently also was um, past president of the uh, American As Association of Facial and Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeons. So, um, And then another really nice, um, wonderful thing that Dr. Quartella does is um, he is the founder of Hugs, which is Help Us Give Smiles. Um, so I'm just going to let one more person in here. And um, they just got back from a mission uh, in Ecuador. Uh, I think it was about a week ago. So he'll probably touch on that a little bit. Um, again, on the bottom, there is the chat box that if anyone has any questions, they can um, just input any questions. I'm happy to answer. If uh, something is uh, of interest, I'll call it out for Dr. Quatella. And um, at the end, we'll also we'll open it up for uh, further questions. And um, ways that you can contact me to further talk about some potential options. So I am going to go ahead and mute myself and then um, turn it over to Dr. Patella. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you, uh, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, can you see me okay? Brooke, can you see me? Yep, I can see you good. Okay, great. All righty. So, um, I wanted to start tonight by talking a little bit about the philosophy that we have at Lindsay House. And one of the things that we try to emphasize is naturalness. And uh, it's important when you look at the nose, especially, that it isn't just a, a perfect nose, that it's a nose that really harmonizes with the face and derives balance with the face. We, we have a couple uh, mantras uh, that we have. And one of them is that there's no shortcuts to quality. And my staff hates it when I get to the end of the nose and I'm just not happy. And then there's another half hour of just doing and undoing and, and until I'm happy. And, and I, I truly believe this, Dr. Koenig, who's been my partner for a long time, I know he subscribes to this and, and all our junior partners do too, that, that you know, anytime you see something you know, that's very quick for a lunch hour procedure, uh, something that's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Um, the other thing is that it's always important to do the right thing. Surgery is not for everybody. And some people are just not good candidates for surgery. And so uh, it, it is often the case 
that I'm talking people out of surgery. And, and in many cases, that is the right thing. So I uh, wanna sort of also touch on something, which is that um, the, uh, sorry, let me go back. That there's a little bit more transparency with plastic surgery. I, I've noticed with my patients and a little bit later, you'll see some social media posts. Uh, people are just open, more open about it. And Mark Jacobs uh, recently, uh, you know, had a facelift in New York City. Actually, uh, Mark Jacobs was done by one of my former fellows, Dr. Giacono, who's in New York City. Um, and, you know, he was totally open about it, uh, posted about it, allowed uh, uh, Dr. Giacono to post about it, which you know, is really different. I mean, it's kind of a, a changing pattern that we see. Um, here uh, you see Martin Short uh, with Selena Gomez. And uh, he said, it's hard for me to express my excitement because the Botox is fresh right now. And again, you know, both of them sharing their Botox experiences with everyone. So the, the, this is a changing trend. Now, when I look at the face, and I look at the width, the horizontal widths, there is the rule of fifths. So from the ear to the corner of the eye, from the corner of the eye to the inner corner of the eye is a fifth, and the nose represents one fifth the width of the nose. So this proportion is important. So when you look at this beautiful face, it's beautiful because the proportions are there and the proportions come from skeletal structure, from the bony, structure. The nose is part of that bony structure, and it is one of the major um, contour things. So, um, you know, when we when we look at the, uh, uh, the vertical, the red dot is from the hairline to the nasal frontal angle, from there to the uh, base of the nose, and from the base of the nose to the chin, that should be roughly third. So when we're looking at the, the face vertically, we have the rule of thirds. Now, restoring the, the contours uh, can involve a chin implant, a cheek implant, uh, altering the nose. Those are all contour altering surgeries. They're not aging related surgeries. They're really things that change contour. And we'll talk a little bit more about how not only the nose, but how the chin plays a role in getting harmony and proportion in the face. Now, Symmetry is important, but I will tell you that only 10% of the patients who come in my office are truly symmetrical. And, you know, I look at the nose and make sure it's symmetrical, but sometimes there's other facial asymmetries. Most commonly, one side of the face is bigger than the other, slightly bigger. And so that side of the nose is slightly bigger. And if you made the two sides match, it wouldn't match that side of the face. So you really have to look at the nose in, in the context of the whole face. Having said that, the width of the base of the nose should be within the corners of the eyes. If you dropped plumb lines, parallel lines down, uh, that's what should define the nostrils. Also, when we look at the nose from the base view, it should be triangular. It shouldn't be trapezoidal or boxy. And the nostrils make up about two thirds of the base and the, what we call the infratip lobule, which is the area here, that makes up roughly one third. Now, there's a lot of history to, to nasal reconstruction and way before we did cosmetic re, uh, renovation of the nose, we did uh, reconstruction for defects. Very popular in India, punishment was to basically chop off someone's nose. So, and and the, one of the more common offenses was adultery. So it, and it was not uncommon to see people, uh, you know, roaming the streets with their nose cut off. And this was very disfiguring. It was also kind of a, uh, a branding of the fact that you did something very wrong. And so the original surgeries of nasal reconstruction started in India, where they would take a flap of skin from the forehead and turn it down onto the nose. With a lot of perfection, we still reconstruct large nasal defects this way. 
Um, and, you know, we'll use the forehead skin for external lining, sometimes the cheek skin for internal lining and ear cartilage for cartilage reconstruction. This is a gentleman who had a defect from a skin cancer on the tip of his nose, where we actually, um, you know, used a little bit of cartilage and then we used uh, some skin from his nose where we actually rotated skin from above to below and we were able to reconstruct this. Um, actually, he actually, uh, this gentleman also had the forehead skin rotated down. And these can be really good. They can look fairly imperceptible. A little piece of history for Rochester, which I, I, I think is, is very interesting. And um, the first rhinoplasty, the first cosmetic rhinoplasty ever performed in North America was performed in 1887 <laughs> on South Clinton Avenue, right here in Rochester, New York, about two blocks from our, our center. The doctor's name was Dr. John Rowe, and he was truly, uh, uh, you know, nationally famous for this operation. It was a little before George Eastman and Kodak photography. Um, and so many of the pictures in his papers were, were hand sketches of the improvements that he got with these noses. Um, he is an interesting person. I researched him a little bit. And um, he was the first president of the Rochester Academy of Medicine. So if you go to Rochester Academy of Medicine on East Avenue and you look at the roster of presidents through the years, uh, uh, John Rowe, who was an otolaryngologist, was the first president. And, uh, you know, this is something that um, uh, is, is like a little bit, little less known bit at Rochester history. At any rate, um, <clears throat> We can do some things uh, without uh, doing surgery. So this young lady has a little bit of a hump on her nose. And by actually filling a little bit with a liquid filler, like very much the same ones that we use for nasolabial folds, uh, Juvederm uh, in this case, you can fill that in a little bit and raise the tip a little bit and fill the base here a little bit and actually straighten the bridge of the nose and give the illusion that someone had a rhinoplasty. This can be done not only with um, a, a temporary filler, a resorbable filler, but also can be done with a permanent filler. Um, it's, it's only great for subtle changes. If you have a lot of tip width, um, it doesn't work. But hiding simple bumps and humps, you can actually get a, a very nice dorsum. Um, and, you know, if you're using a resorbable filler, it, they're temporary results. It's amazing how many people seek rhinoplasty. In, in about a half a million people every year seek consultation for rhinoplasty for, appearance, for enhancement of their nose. Nose is really, really important. It is the most significant contour change that you can make because it, it does occupy the central position of the face. And the size and shape of the nose has just a tremendous impact on appearance. Um, I, you know, I write here that it enhances self-confidence, but people don't want to hear that. Uh, you know, people, uh, people come for consultations. Everybody says, look, I'm confident. You know, I don't, that's not why I'm doing it. But the reality is I've seen young kids blossom. I still have, I remember doing a nose on someone who was 18, now post college, they're you know partners in at uh, you know at uh, some of the big uh, um, stock you know brokerage firms in New York City, and still send me a Christmas card saying you know how it changed their life. And um, I think that you know it, it's uh, to me one of the most rewarding operations I do. It um, it can also have a functional component. We'll talk about that a little more later, but you can correct impaired breathing. And so some people have deviated septums or enlarged turbinates, or the nose was broken either, you know, in a cheerleading fall or in, you know, sports and whatnot. And so sometimes you can actually do two things at once, improve function as well as form. Um, so what we wanna do is look at the size of the nose in general. Sometimes the nose is too big. 
We want to look at the width at the bridge because that's solid bone. We really can't change the width at the bridge very easily. We want to look at the nasal tip, you know, that is, if it's bulbous, drooping, or too, too upturned. Some people come in uh, genetically with a nose that's turned up too much and we turn it downward. We want to look at the nostrils. Are they large? Are they wide? Are they upturned? And again, we want to look at that asymmetry to make sure there's no crookedness, no deviation. Um, when do we do it and who's a good candidate? So sometimes I will do a 13 year old young lady if the nose is developed. And you know, a, a, an infantile nose, when, when you look at a baby or even an eight year old or a 10 year old, the nostrils are round, they're not oval. And we call those noses infantile. But if the nostrils are oblong, there's a there's you know a big bump and the nose really has gone through developmental changes. I, I, I'll do young women as young as 13 and, and men 15, usually a little bit later. You have to be physically healthy to undergo the operation. I prefer non-smokers, um, and you and you have to be realistic about expectations. In this day and age of computer imaging. We can get within 90%. I, I always tell patients when I'm drawing a nose and, and we're morphing the nose with the imaging software, I, I'm not just creating a pretty nose. I'm really doing the steps of the operation in my head and then coming up with something I think is realistic. And I say that 90%, 90 to 95% of the time, I can get 90 to 95% of what I draw. In five to 8%, I don't have total control over healing and swelling and things like that, but you can get pretty close. Um, but yeah, but you have to be realistic about what you want. And I hopefully can bring you into that arena of what is and what isn't the worst. Um, it's, a, it's a very highly individualized procedure. I think in my mind, it's one of the most cerebral surgeries I do. It's like a puzzle. And everything you do in the nose has a domino effect. So if you lower the bridge, the nose looks wider. Then you got to narrow the, the, the side walls of the nose. Um, if you drop the tip closer to the face, the nostrils get bigger. And so you, you really have to do this in a, in, a, in a very ordered sequence and have a very structured plan in your mind to get the result you want. Now, there are several types of rhinoplasty. You can have open rhinoplasty, which is where we make a small incision like you see right here. And, uh, and then by lifting that incision and having some incisions inside the nostril, we can actually lift the skin much like you're looking under the hood of a car. This area that is devoid of a lot of oil glands and so it heals pretty well. And sometimes it's, it's, it's inconspicuous. Now we had a nose here, you can see that's crooked. It's a little wide at the tip. And this is her after the surgery, the incision is uh, you know, almost imperceptible. And you can see that by straightening the septum and straightening the cartilages of the nose, we got a, a perfect base to the nose that was crooked to begin with. The other type of rhinoplasty is closed. So in a closed rhinoplasty, um, as you, um, in a closed rhinoplasty, as you see, I'm sorry, as a closed rhinoplasty, the incisions are all inside the nostrils and, um, and they're not, uh, they're not uh, uh, on the skin. And you basically don't elevate the skin except you elevate it inside the nose. Um, this is good for very small adjustments of the nasal bridge, but whenever you have to do any significant amount of tip work, you most likely would like to open it. Um, the nostrils, sometimes the nostrils are large and we can take little wedges down here that, um, that would um, enable us to narrow the nostril base. So that's another thing we do. And here you can see a rhinoplasty where the tip is droopy. She has a dorsal irregularity, a dorsal bump. She has a strong chin. So the tip is drooping down where the chin is coming out. And to me, that's like the two lips of the salmon coming together. And so once we lift the tip up a little bit, it balances much better with her strong chin. 
in addition, taking the bump down, you know, gives this nose a bit of elegance. I, I you know, I, I think that she really fulfilled the rule of thirds, one third here, one third here, and one third here. This is somebody with a very strong lower third where we don't want to put a little itty bitty nose on there that's turned up and short because it won't fit her profile and it won't look right. Um, here's a gentleman who has a, uh, a lot of issues with the uh, collapse of the middle third. The nose is deviated. It's almost S-shaped. You can see it goes like that and then up and then around. And here we had to straighten the upper bone, widen the middle third a little bit, and then, and then take this tip, which was very droopy, elevate it and take the bump off the nose. Um, one thing to note on, oh. It's really emotional from the casting. I, I, I often worry about uh, if they're crying, are they happy or are they like just the opposite, not happy? But uh, clearly this patient was happy. Um, and this is her, so you just saw that fresh, gas comes off, so there's swelling, the nose doesn't look like what I image. But this is the same young lady about six months later. And you can see all the irregularities in this nose, we've kind of ironed out. And the nose is by itself doesn't just pop or stand out. It's not like you're going to look at this person and say, oh, oh my gosh, you know, you've got a beautiful nose. You no, know, it just blends in with her cheekbones, her jawline, and just enhances her other features. If a nose stands out by itself, then you've, you've overdone it or you've done something wrong. Another nose that has what I call an hourglass deformity, where it's wide, narrow, wide, narrow, wide. And what you want is you want a nice arc of the brow and the nose to form without this hourglass configuration. You know, people come in and say, my nose looks bumpy. I don't want it to be so bumpy. But what they're describing is that you see the bone and then you see the transition from the bone to the upper lateral cartilages. And then you see the transition to the lower laterals. And part of the art form of doing rhinoplasty is making these transitions flow. When you look at, you know, uh, drywall in your house and it comes down to the floor, you've got to put some molding there, base molding or shoe molding, because the, the interface isn't good. Well, here we have the same situation. Bone is meaning cartilage, and the two are dissimilar, and it, and it takes, it, it's a real trick to get them to blend in so it doesn't look like the before picture. And here you can see we, we reshaped her tip. So the tip is more refined and blends in better with your face. And to me, it makes her cheekbones pop because the nose now goes for something very rounded to something more angular. And she's got nice angular features, a nice jawline, a nice cheekbone, nice brow. And just having a more angular nose makes those features kind of come out. Here we have another long nose that is actually droopy in the tip and then the tip is large. So we elevate the tip. Everybody's worried about it being too turned up. She has a tip that creates an angle of about 85 degrees with her lip. We're taking her to 95 degrees, elevating it 10 to 15 degrees. And, and that, you know, is, it makes for a much better nose. Um, this is a situation where we um, have a nose that needs to be turned up a little bit, but the dorsal irregular convexity of the bridge uh, and the bump there is really the biggest change. And you can see how dramatic, we're talking about taking this bridge down millimeters, not, in, not half inch or quarter inch. We're talking about three millimeters off this bridge, elevating the tip a little bit, and it totally transforms her profile. Um, this is another nose, which we call a tension nose. It's over projected. And the nose, the bridge of the nose is actually holding the tip out away from the face. So if you start taking the bump down, what happens here is that the tip just gets closer to the lip. And the, the whole bump is holding the nose out. So you can't just take the bump down. You have to support this tip with cartilage so that the tip stays where you want it. 
and then you're you're enabled to lower the bridge so it's a pleasing contour and, and the contour is pleasing with the with the chin. Now I'm always asked about recovery and downtime. And you know, will I have my dressings after surgery? And the, and, the, and the answer is yes. You may have splints in your nose that are there for a week to help prevent adhesions. You may have a cat, you will have a cast on your nose, which is there for a week. And that um, uh, just enables the bones to heal properly. The cast is um, made of uh, what's called aquaplast, which is kind of like a, uh, it's like a fiberglass that, you know, it's soft when we put it in hot water and then it sets hard with cold water. Um, and then we take that off in a week. The stitches that we talked about under here for an open rhinoplasty, we take those out at three days. Um, and I allow people to do aerobic activity, swimming, diving, running at three weeks. Um, I, you, if you're doing contact sports, uh, I like you to wait six weeks unless you're a pro athlete and then all, all bets are off. Um, you know, you come back, I, I follow noses for about a year. And the reason for that is that there's always little tweaks that you can do along the way to help swelling, to help, especially when you're making a big nose small, you have a lot of extra skin. That skin has to shrink wrap to the new shape. And so there's little tweaks that you can do along the way that will make that nose be what it's gonna be. Most of the change is front loaded. So when you get the cast off, you're gonna see a difference right out of the box. Six weeks later, a lot of the swelling's down. But I would say the last 15% of the result you get over the course of a year. And that's why we follow people for a year. Here's a, a report. Ashley's going to take this to a three day post -up. Ashley, six months later. And so you can see that the swelling now is down compared to when the cast first came off. And she has really nice tip definition. I call these the facets, you know, like facets on a diamond, these flat spots. They don't show up until now, six months to a year. Um, so you, you have to be a little bit patient. But right when the cast comes off, you, you'll see an improvement for sure. Um, so we talked a little bit briefly about how the nasal surgery can help breathing. And, you know, the septum is always a mystery to people, but it's really the party wall that separates the right and left side of the nose on the inside. And that's what creates the two nostrils. So we're looking at a cross section here. And then the turbinates are these large things that hang in your nose, which humidify the air you breathe and warm it. Um, and you can't do without them, but unfortunately they swell with surgery, they swell with allergies. And so sometimes we have to use a little Flonase after surgery to keep those things shrunk down. Even if we have a very straight septum, we gotta make sure they're not too big. Um, these are the cartilages that we're manipulating, the upper, the upper lateral, so the, the first third of the nose is bone. And then we have upper lateral cartilages and we have the lower lateral. These cartilages, as you age, like everything else in your body, stretches and becomes droopier. So some people say, I never had a bump on my nose earlier, but then as the nose ages and the tip droops a little bit, you can have it, you can develop a bump there. So um, this is a, a, a nose that didn't work. It just didn't breathe. You can see that the septum is way off center. The nasal bones are going a little bit to the right, and then the septum is deciding to go exactly the opposite direction. Uh, his upper lateral cartilage here is all caved in. And when you look in a nose like this, uh, there is no air passage uh, at all on one side. And so we went in there, we straightened it, we supported the tip, um, and we supported these upper lateral cartilages with spreader grafts. And now he's got a perfectly functioning nose that looks better as well. This is another uh, deviated septum, and we 
when it has a straightened out. So we talked briefly about the importance of the relationship of the chin and nose. And, you know, I, I measure all kinds of angles, but a line through the base of the nose, uh, the chin should just come about to it. And sometimes if there's greater than a centimeter difference, in other words, the chin is back a centimeter or more, then I encourage people to do a chin implant because the nose will always look too big on that face. So when we look at this chin and nose, the nose is large in profile. You can see here it's large in profile. But if you cover the bottom half of this on your screen, the nose isn't that big relative to her brow and her upper lip. The minute that you bring the chin back in, you can see that the nose looks too big. So here, by putting a chin implant in, it offsets uh, the size of the nose. And now, instead of having a total convexity to this face where the forehead slopes away, the dorsum is convex, the upper lower lip and chin make a convexity, we now have more of an in and out pattern, uh, which is what we strive for. Um, this is also uh, a, a situation where we added a little chin and we did a little bit of contouring under the neck to give her a better platform under her neck uh, behind her chin. Um, this is a, a, another person where we do deep neck contouring with the nose. So when you look at her, her neck in profile, you can see that the chin's a little weak, but also this is full. And um, a lot of times pa patients will come see me for a facelift and this point goes straight down like that. There's no depth to the neck. This sort of thing doesn't age well. And I believe that when I get those necks that they actually started, you know, in, uh, you know, when, in youth. And so in here, basically, this isn't just liposuction. This is going in there through an incision, adding a small chin implant, very small, but going under the muscle in the neck, which is called the platysma. And you'll find fat under that muscle. You'll also find two muscles called the digastrics. They're paired. And by contouring those and tightening the platysma muscle and taking that fat from underneath the muscle, we can get a very nice striking neckline and, and get a chin that actually matches it. Um, this will age well. And this actually, as this point starts dropping forward, even just a centimeter, it'll look like there is no jawline. So this is a rhinoplasty with deep neck contour. Now, I, uh, it, you know, in conclusion, I just want to say that I, pr I take pride in the fact that at the Lindsay House, you know, it's a beauty campus where we do everything under one roof. So we not only do facial plastic surgery, which is done by myself, my partner, um, uh, Dr. Heather Lee, my junior partner, Dr. Alex Montague, but we also do plastic surgery of the body, body contouring, breast augmentation uh, with my long-term partner, Dr. Bill Koenig and our, and our new partner, Dr. Ashley Amalfi. Um, they do amazing work and, it, and it's just beautiful. I'm so, I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Amalfi was one of my fellows and decided to join us and she's just amazing. She has a huge following now. And Dr. Montague started with us in December and he's also become extremely busy. Um, we do hair restoration. So not only do we put hair on your head or your brows or where it, your eyebrows or wherever you need it, but we take it out too, like if you have unwanted hair. The medical spa does many, many different laser treatments, uh, micro needling treatments, um, uh, BBL, BBL Hero. We do, uh, there's laser hair removal. There's just about every machine you can think of we have there. Um, we have the spa on the uh, third floor of the Lindsay House, but we also have a new medical spa in Victor on 96, just beyond uh, uh, Eastview Mall. And, and we have uh, 14 treatment rooms there with exactly the same laser uh, and uh, you know, injectables, Botox fillers, in addition to having a longevity center. Uh, which focuses on regenerative medicine with Dr. Maria Karapetis and with Julie Chat, our nurse practitioner. We're doing bioidentical hormone replacement uh, as well as longevity medicine. 
Uh, we are we have our own ambulatory surgery center at the Lindsay House. We are a triple AHC ambulatory surgery center, which means that we're certified by Medicare and the state. We go through state audits and, and all that sort of thing. We have a carriage house at Lindsay House for overnight stay for patients. Um, most of our patients from out of town, out of state, will avail themselves to, to the carriage house, but there's uh, a number of patients in town that just don't want to burden a family member and they can stay there as well. Um, in conclusion, I, I want to say that um, that uh, one of my, my, my greatest pastime, actually, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little boring, but my greatest pastime is to, to go on these hugs missions. And we started hugs 22 years ago. Uh, I've been to Ecuador almost 22 times now. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't go last year, uh, but uh, we, we went just last week. I got back Sunday and we did 52 uh, uh, surgeries. Uh, we did, uh, uh, you know, 51 of them were on kids born without ears. And that's a little bit of what you're seeing in these pictures. And then uh, we also had a child with a tumor of his upper and lower eyelid where we had to do uh, extensive skin grafting. Uh, you might have seen it on our on our Instagram. Uh, really rewarding. Um, I can't tell you that uh, when we go on these trips, we get a whole lot more than what we give. Uh, I've never seen more appreciative people in my life. Um, and you know, the big difference is uh, without us and similar groups like us going there, um, they would not ever realize these procedures that we're doing. And so. We're going back to Guatemala. We, we in the middle of COVID, or we saw a week, uh, a quiet spot last year in September, and we snuck away to Guatemala last year. Uh, this year, we're definitely going in June, and we're going back in September to Guatemala. And there's a possibility that we'll go to Peru in October. Keep our fingers crossed that we don't have another COVID surge. We did have to cancel our trip to Vietnam uh, this past March because COVID was out of control in March of 2022 in Vietnam. So um, I, I thank you uh, for your kind attention and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have, um, either uh, questions in the chat that you know, Brooke can uh, help address. Brooke, if you come back on. Um, yep, I'm here. And, uh, I'm gonna just stop sharing for this moment here so that we can get us all back. Um, and uh, are there any questions in the chat? Not, not right now. No one. I know a couple people had asked that they're going to have some questions. So if they want to um, either type them or unmute and then ask the questions. Yeah, I'm totally open to questions. So please feel free. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to unmute in order to ask a question. Uh, what about the cost? Uh, Brooke? <laughs> so that's that's a very good question. Um, so rhinoplasty is um, an individualized procedure. So it kind of depends on um, different parameters when it comes to the cost structure. Um, when we do give pricing, though, we do are we are able to give pricing, which includes the surgeon's fee, the facility and the anesthesia. Um, so the price that I'm just going to kind of give you off the top of my head is a variable amount, just it's dependent on each individual. But typically with all of those fees, it can really run in between, I would say, um, if it's a primary rhinoplasty, it would be between 13 to 15,000. Um, and then there's some variability there too. Thank you. Yeah. I see, I see a question from uh, Robin here to everyone. And um, and the, and the, the question is, uh, uh, if you had something worked on 40 years ago, a deviated septum, um, and then uh, it, it sort of didn't work, and you go back to have the deviated septum refixed, or so revised seven years ago, and it still uh, is a breathing issue, the question is, can it be fixed and would insurance pay for it? And the answer is, uh, um, you know, Almost everything can be fixed uh, without seeing it. I, I don't want to sound uh, haughty uh, and say, yep, we can fix it. But 
the reality is that most of those situations can be fixed. Um, if it's if we're doing if we're not doing cosmetics, like a lot of the noses I showed you had both a functional component and cosmetic. But if we're not doing any cosmetic alteration, then insurance would cover the septum uh, 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 fully. I mean, well, depending on your plan and your copay, but they would cover it. Um, and uh, the thing is that um, if you have a cosmetic component, then there's a cosmetic component, and then there's the septum which we bill to insurance. So, so, but uh, in this case, it, it seems like you're mainly interested in getting the septum corrected so you can breathe better and that would absolutely be covered. Um, and then, another question. oh, there's another question about what do you use um, to keep a nose straight? And, you know, do you use rib bone or cartilage and, uh, and then implants? And um, the, the thing is that rib cartilage, and we use rib cartilage often, um, especially when someone the revision rhinoplasty and they've had their septum taken. They might have had ear cartilage borrowed. Um, so we'll go to rib. The problem with rib cartilage to use it on the entire bridge is that it has a high incidence of warping. It can actually twist a little bit. So often on the bridge of the nose, I either like to use bone and the best source for bone is from the side of the scalp, you know, like uh, there's an area here where you can take the outer table of bone and still have an inner table of bone that protects your, your brain and, and forms a skull barrier. Uh, or we use uh, Gore-Tex. Now Gore-Tex, you're familiar with it because of raincoats, but the reality is we, we also use Gore-Tex for blood vessel replacement in your body. Like if you have a major blood vessel that's made out of Gore-Tex. And they also make a nasal implant uh, where if you're trying to raise the bridge or camouflage, you could use Gore-Tex. Um, that doesn't twist or turn. Uh, bone doesn't twist or turn. And usually you can straighten the nose pretty well with one of those two options. Um, uh, it's important when you're looking at the bridge of the nose that whatever you use is continuous. You, you know, putting little bits and pieces of cartilage in there might look good for five years, but then ultimately there's going to be shift or, or resorption and it's not going to look straight again. So. Um, some, oh, sorry, Robin. Yes. Um, the con is there a consultation fee? I was also thinking about, I turned 60, uh, 65 and I'm starting in droop. So I was thinking about, would you do the surgery? Because I would like to get my nose fixed as far as the DDA to septum. But I also would like to have, you know, the facelift along with that. Would that be at the same time? Yeah. So, you know, um, do you remember when I showed you the cartilages in the nose and I said mm -hmm. that they stretch? So there's a thing called an aging nose. And yeah. it, we just did this last week. We, we do it quite often where someone will come in and they'll say, you know, my nose has really changed over the years or it's just kind of stretched out. It got a little longer. Uh, they may have had a little tiny bump when they were younger, but then the bump looked like it grew. But really what all that happened was the lower part of the tip stretched downward and then the bump appeared. And so we'll often do where we, you know, alter the nose, you know, whether or not there's a functional component, but fix the breathing and then raise the tip a little bit and take a little bit of the bump down. If you raise the tip, and you do a facelift at the same time is very rejuvenating because, you know, if you lift the tip up, you're kind of restoring what they had in youth. And then at the same time, taking up the extra skin in the neck and muscle. And, and you know, like I showed you that young lady at the end, um, uh, she had uh, uh, the deep neck contouring. Well, we do deep neck contouring with facelifts. And uh, uh, recently we did, uh, you know, I, I, I can talk about Sandra, right? Because she's posted. Is that right? Is that correct? Okay. So, so uh, Sandra Dorley, who's our, our district attorney, um, she's very open about it. But it's very interesting that her neck was just very full. And so we did deep neck contouring on her. I, I could have done that to her when she was 18. You know, it, it's a genetic thing. And so, but as people age, so this is a, 
this is a, a combo when you do nose and face that is extremely rejuvenating. Um, I wanted to ask you, answer your question though, Robin, about a consultation fee. So um, I alluded to this in the beginning and the first step in the process is you would come in to meet with me for an image enhancement session. Um, there is a fee for that appointment. It's, it's, it's fairly nominal, it's $55, but it is a really, really detailed appointment. And at that time I'm able to go over all of the particular questions, do some computer imaging and talk in particular about um, you know, all the different options that you have. And it doesn't have to be just isolated to, you know, the nose. It can, it can cover lots of other things um, related to just the face, though. Um, and then one of the other things that um, I was up here, though, um, is if you wanted to contact the office and speak directly to me, um, my direct line, I can give you that. Um, I can actually write it in the, the chat too. So that way you have a, a hard copy of that. But um, it's uh, my direct line is 269-3616. So I'll write that in the chat too. So you all have it. Um, and then um, I think I sent that to everybody. Maybe not. I might've sent it to just someone. So I apologize. Um, and then another question that was um, individualized is there is, is there an age limit to rhinoplasty? So you can kind of touch on Dr. Patella, a couple interesting patients that we've had recently. Yeah, so um, sometimes, you know, people who are older will fall and, you know, face plant and break their nose. And we do, you know, I've done people like that in their 80s uh, where we straighten the nose, get them breathing again. And so that's not a problem. But the things that are more, the things that I find more fascinating, I did a, a woman, I don't know, earlier this year, or maybe it was late last year, she was about 76. And she came in, never had her nose done, wanted to do her nose all her life. And basically her, her husband passed and uh, he didn't want her to do her nose. And so once that happened, he, she came in and uh, was all in on getting her nose done. And, you know, um, age is not a factor, it's health. I have refused people in their 50s for a nose or a facelift because they were brittle diabetics or they weren't healthy. Um, I did a facelift last year uh, on somebody who's 94. Uh, we did a forehead lift, lower lids, and a facelift, and she sailed through the procedure. She's very active. She dances three times a week. She's probably more active than I am, and that's that's really the key, you know. If you're, you know, if uh, if you take care of yourself, it's the same usual things, you know, sleep, diet, and exercise. Then you're a candidate. <laughs> right. There's been a couple of older patients recently, the, uh, the gentleman who is 77, who still plays uh, softball. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Um, so uh, just a question that was kind of indirect. Um, uh, oh, I neglected to put that. 585 is the area code of Rochester, I apologize. Um, trying to multitask here and I'm not, uh, not doing a very good job. Um, and um, one of the other questions is uh, the fee that I did reference as far as cost is the, it, it does include the surgeon's fee, the facility, as well as the anesthesia. Um, we try to include pretty much all fees. So there's no surprises. Um, in that. And then we do offer financing too, which I can, you know, go more um, there's a, individualized with as far as that goes. There's a, there's a question about what does care credit finance? And I, I don't, I, I don't know, like, I know it covers the surgeon's fee, but I'm not sure. Like, does it, it cover does. It's, yep. It's covered. Um, care credit does allow you to finance the surgeon's fee in its entirety over 18 months at no interest. So it's a really nice way to extend the payback and you're not paying any additional interest on that amount. Um, unfortunately, the um, anesthesia group and the Lindsay House Surgery Center 
is not part of that financing option, but um, the largest portion, which is uh, the fee to the surgeon, is something that is um, able to be financed. So that helps quite a bit. Is there but oh, sorry, is it required to stay in the house or can it be an outpatient type surgery? This is outpatient. Um, staying, at, staying at the carriage house is, is optional. Uh, there's a couple of procedures that I do where you get swelling of the eyes and things. It's called a mid facelift. And there, like I prefer if you stayed, but for noses and facelifts, you can go home. What or if you, I was going to say, if you live more than 30 minutes away too, we do like for patients to stay uh, a little bit more local. What is the scheduling availability for a rhinoplasty? Mm -hmm. So the first consultation would be with me, and I'm generally able to see patients pretty quickly, usually within a couple weeks. And then the time frame for rhinoplasty is a little bit dependent. Um, Dr. Coachella um, ha is typically booked out a, a, a fair amount of months. Sometimes there's some cancellations, um, you know, with kind of the current situation of things. But generally, he is booked out to fall. But sometimes we have some options a little bit sooner. Um, but to meet with me, you can certainly get that in um, probably within the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, it makes me crazy when you know people want to come in sooner and all that. Uh, we're booking like I think October now and, and into November. But if someone's like in a real hurry, Dr. Lee, my, my junior partner is, is amazing. I, I would let her operate on my family. But Dr. Montague is all the same. Um, they haven't been doing it as long as I have, but they're, they're just excellent. I would never have hired them if they weren't good. So there's, there's other options. Any other questions? Let's see. And we also have a lot more pictures um, too that when we do meet as, uh, as an individual appointment then I'm able to um, show you, particularly if it's uh, with some similarities of kind of what you're bothered by. All right, well, if, if, if there aren't any more questions, I, uh, I just wanna thank you guys, it's, it's beautiful out. And so, you know, this is the, you could be just walking the dog or something. <laughs> so I appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. And, uh, and I look forward to meeting some of you in person. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank I you hope so to much. talk to some of you guys soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.